Well, you may have noticed as we read through Psalm 80 that there's a particular refrain that's repeated three different times. So if you look back through Psalm 80 on the pages of your Bible, you'll find in verse 3 and in verse 17 and in verse 19 that three times the psalmist repeats uh, essentially an identical refrain. Verse 3, he says, O God, restore us and cause your face to shine upon us and we will be saved. And in verse 7, O God of hosts, restore us and cause your face to shine upon us and we will be saved. And then again in verse 19, O Lord God of hosts, restore us, cause your face to shine upon us and we will be saved. This psalm is written most likely around the time of the Assyrian triumph over northern Israel, either right before it or right after it. And this is an extremely low point, particularly in the history of northern Israel, the ten tribes of northern Israel. They have been, at this point, most likely scattered away from their homeland, overthrown, taken to places outside of the promised land, and they hardly reflect anything at all of what they were originally intended to be. If you think of what God has said, even as we've worked our way through Genesis, that this nation that came from Abraham was to be a blessing to all the nations. And then we we look at where they're at as we come to this point in history in which Psalm 80 is written, and they don't look much like that at all. They, they, They don't look much like what God said they would be. And so Asaph, who is probably in in Judah, in the southern kingdom, as he writes this psalm, he cries out on behalf of northern Israel, of the northern kingdom, and he says, restore us. So the theme of this psalm, it's restoration. Restore us. Cause your face to shine on us, and we will be saved. In other words, Asaph is saying, God, this is not what we are meant to be. This is not what your people are supposed to look like. Restore us to what we're supposed to be. Make us again what you created us to be, what you redeemed us to be as your people. Restore us. Accomplish in us the purpose for which you saved us. And that same cry should be the church's cry today. In fact, it should be the church's cry throughout all of history. From 2,000 years ago to today, the church always has reason to cry in one way or another, Lord, restore us. We're not what we're supposed to be. We're not, we're not there yet. Consider for a moment the spiritual condition of your own heart and ask yourself, are you everything that you want to be as a Christian? Do you, do you have all of the love for God in your heart that you wish you had? Are you as full of the fruit of the Spirit as you know you ought to be? Or consider the, the church, either locally this church, Christ Church Radford, or globally? Is the church all that it's supposed to be? Does it reflect the image of God in all of his glory as well as it could? Is it as brilliant of a reflection of our Redeemer as it should be? Is it? I think if we're if we're honest, any sincerity, any sensitivity to the the reality of our own hearts and the reality of of the church local and, and global, I think we all admit we're not there yet. We're not there yet. We have not reached the pinnacle of spirituality yet. We are not the reflection of Christ that we wish we were and that we know we should be. And when we realize that, when we realize that that we haven't gotten as far as we should have gotten, then the only thing we can do is cry out the cry of Asaph here, Lord, restore us. Cause your face to shine on us. Be be, be near to us with your presence. That's, That's it. That's the That's the only thing that makes the church what it ought to be, is the presence of our God drawing near to us and causing his face to shine on us. And so we can we can cry out with the psalmist Asaph for ourselves personally and for the church locally and globally. God, restore us, make us what we're supposed to be. And I'm not saying that that we have any particular uh, we're not in a particularly downward point in our local church's history. You may not be at a particularly low point in your personal spirituality. I'm not necessarily saying the church global is at a particularly low point. 
We should recognize the great things that God has done in us individually and in us as a church and in his church globally. But at the same time, we should be honest. And when we see that there's, there's still more to, to have, there's more Christ-likeness for us to possess, then, then if it doesn't make us say to some degree, Lord, restore us. I long to be made what I was redeemed to be more fully. If, if, that, if that's not at all a cry of our heart, then we need restoration more than anybody. Because that's signs, that's some serious signs of spiritual decline. When our hearts cease crying out to God for more of himself and more likeness to Christ, that's, that's a big warning sign. And that tells us something's off and we need to be restored at a deep level. And so this is the cry of, of this psalm, Psalm 80. Lord, restore us, cause your face to shine on us. And the result of that will be that we will be saved. And so as we work our way through this psalm, let me uh, suggest three guiding thoughts, three thoughts for, for a general framework in which we can uh, make this cry to God. First, God is your shepherd and your king who hears. So that's the first stanza, verses one and two. God is your shepherd and king who hears. And then the second thing, the second stanza there, which is uh, verses four to six. God has no interest in unrepentant prayers. God has no interest in unrepentant prayers. And then the last point there in the remaining verses in the last stanza, God's past kindness gives us hope for future mercy. God's past kindness gives us hope for future mercy. And so God first is your shepherd and your king who hears. Look at verses one and two. Oh, give ear, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned above the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your power and come to save us. So the first words, oh, give ear. There's, there's nothing tricky about understanding what the psalmist means by that. Oh, give ear. Just listen to us. Hear us. Turn your ear toward us so that you will hear our cry as we raise our prayer to you. And then he, he explains why he has reason to believe that God should turn his ear to his people. Look at what he says. Give ear. Why? You're the shepherd of Israel. You're the one who led Joseph like a flock. A shepherd is attentive to the needs of his sheep. If a shepherd hears Here's one of his sheep bleeding, bleating with a T, and he knows that it's a cry of panic. No good shepherd would, would stay lounged up against the tree while his sheep is in some form of, of extreme danger. If he hears the sheep cry, a good shepherd stands and goes to his sheep to rescue him. And God is the shepherd of Jacob, or the shepherd of Israel. If you remember from a couple weeks ago in Genesis, Israel is another name for Jacob. Jacob was renamed Israel. And so verse one, give ear shepherd of Israel, could be also translated shepherd of Jacob. Give ear shepherd of Jacob. And it's interesting, it's worth pointing out that the first time that shepherd is used as reference to God is from the mouths of, mouth of Jacob in Genesis. We'll get there uh, eventually with the series through Genesis. But in Genesis chapter 48, this is what Jacob says, and it's interesting as well that it's when he blesses Joseph. So, so Psalm 80, it says, you who lead, or uh, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. Shepherd of Jacob, you who lead Joseph. And as Jacob comes to bless his son Joseph, these are the words that come out of his mouth, mouth at the end of his life. He says, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day. Jacob, the first one to refer to God as his shepherd, says, God has been my shepherd all of my life to this day. Without any, any, any break, without any ceasing along the whole way, God has continually been my shepherd all my life to this day. And, and that's significant when we think about Jacob's life. I mean, we've been reading through it. His life was not smooth. There were ups and there were downs. He was deceived. He was disappointed. He was misled. Uh, he, he strayed. He was sinful. He was disobedient. He was a deceiver. And yet all along the way, Jacob can look back and, and see, you know, if, if it were not for God as my shepherd, I would have been lost. I would have been ruined. But it is God, my shepherd, who has brought me to this point today. As I bless my son, Joseph, it's all of him. 
He has led me. He has guided me. He has been my shepherd all of my life to this day. And he's the one who leads Joseph like a flock. And again, we're going to get there in the series through Genesis, but Joseph's life wasn't any smoother than Jacob's, was it? He had a pretty rough go there for, for a couple of decades. And yet all through it, God led him like a shepherd. Through every valley of discouragement and tribulation and trial, God was leading him. It was God who was his shepherd, leading him like a flock. And so the psalmist asks, God, give ear, listen to us, because you're our shepherd who cares for us and who leads us. That, that's essentially what's being communicated there. You're the shepherd who led, for, led Jacob and cared for him. You're that same shepherd for us today as your people. And so give ear and hear and listen as we cry out to you. But then also, not only is he their shepherd, he's also the king seated among the cherubim, the king who hears, verse, the end of verse 1 into verse 2, you who are enthroned above the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your power and come to save us. So what, is, what does the psalmist mean when he says before the cherubim or, among, or above the cherubim? What's he referring to? He's talking about the Ark of the Covenant. So if you, if you read through the Old Testament over and over again, when reference is being made to, to God being above or among or between the cherubim, it's talking about the Ark of the Covenant. And his reference to, to Ephraim and Benjamin and, and Manasseh here, um, it, it makes even more clear that he has in mind the Ark of the Covenant. And this is why. Back in Numbers, those three tribes were listed together as those in, during the wilderness journey. They were the ones camped to the west together. So the 12 tribes, they were divided into four camps. And on the west, I guess for you guys, west is over here. On the west side of, uh, the, of Israel's camp were Benjamin, Manasseh, and Ephraim. And what was in the middle of the camp? The tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant. And so as people rose up to move, if they're moving from the west to the east, what's going before those three tribes? The Ark of the Covenant. They're on the west side, moving east, if you're moving east and you're on the west side and the ark is to your east, it's in front of you. And so what the psalmist is saying is, is God, your, your ark, your covenant, it went before these three tribes. So he's referring to the, the ark of the covenant. And there's something really important about the ark of the covenant and its meaning in, in the Old Testament and ceremonial laws. The language here of, of cherubim as it, as it refers back to the Ark of the Covenant, it calls our attention to the mercy seat. So if you're familiar with the Ark of the Covenant, they built the Ark, and then God said on top of that Ark, put the mercy seat, and on one side of the mercy seat, put a cherub facing inward, and on the other side, put another cherub facing the other cherub, facing one another, but not looking at each other. Where are they looking? They're looking down at the mercy seat that's below them. And so on either side of this Ark of the Covenant, seated on each side of the mercy seat, you have these cherubim. And then listen to what God says in Exodus chapter 25. There I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are upon the Ark of the Testimony, I will speak to you about all that I will give you in commandment for the sons of Israel. So what's the significance of above the cherubim. What's the significance of this reference to the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat? It's where God meets with his people. It's where the blood is sprinkled, atonement made, so that God can draw near and meet with his people. And we see that same concept in First Chronicles later on in Israel's history, where it says, David and all Israel, they went to bring up from there the Ark of God, the Lord who is enthroned above the cherubim, where his name is called. The Lord who is enthroned above the cherubim. What's the significance of that? That's where God is called upon. That's where his name is invoked. That's where he meets with his people. And so the psalmist, he says, God, you're our shepherd, but you're also the king who is enthroned upon the cherubim. You're the king who condescends to meet with your people because of the atonement sprinkled on the mercy seat. And so these two things are foundational for any attempt that we, we have of, of seeking God to restore us. If you don't start here, you're going to start on some other false foundation. We don't go to a, an Ark of the Covenant. We don't go to a literal mercy seat. We go to the throne of grace. And Christ, 
having made atonement with his own blood, he now is the one who guarantees our access to be heard by God, to invoke his name and be heard by him, to meet with our God. And as Christians, if we don't start there, as we cry out to God for restoration, we're going to be in some serious error. It's justification because of Christ's redeeming sacrificial for you that gives you the only hope you will ever have to call upon the name of God. And if you are coming to him for any reason other than the shed blood of Jesus sprinkled on the mercy seat for your behalf, your prayer for restoration is worthless. You're not starting at the right point. It's Christ and it's his shed blood for you that opens up the way for you to draw near. He's the good shepherd who cares for you. And he's also the good shepherd who laid down his life for you so that you could draw near and call upon the name of God. And so as you look at your life and as you look at the church and as you cry out to God, God, restore us, cause your face to shine upon us, and we will be saved. This is the first step in that process. Remember, God is your shepherd. He cares for you. He loves you, not just you, but he loves his church. He loves those whom he has redeemed with his own blood. He loves you as your shepherd and he cares for you. And not only that, but he condescends to meet with his people because of the shed blood of his son. He's the king with all authority. He's enthroned above the cherubim, and yet he condescends to meet with his people because of Christ. And then second, God has no interest in unrepentant prayers. God has no interest in unrepentant prayers. Verses 4 to 6 of the psalm. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry? with the prayer of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears, and you have made them to drink tears in large measure. You make us an object of contention to our neighbors, and our enemies laugh among themselves. So here the psalmist, he begins to describe the turmoil of God's people. Rather than the feasts they once enjoyed as a nation, the only feast they have is their tears. They're feeding on their tears for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's just weeping upon weeping, sorrow upon sorrow. Rather than the blessing to the nations that they were called to be, uh, they're actually an object of contention, stirring up strife with the nations. Rather than conquering their enemies and moving into the land that God had promised them, their enemies are mocking them, laughing at them. It's the opposite of what they're meant to be. And what's the cause of it? Look at those verses. What, what's the cause of this calamity? What's the cause of this turmoil? A particular person is said to be the cause. You. How long will you be angry? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have made them to drink tears in large measure. You have made us an object of contention to our neighbors. God's the cause. It's, it's God's own doing that has caused them to be in the current calamity that they're in. And, and so why is that? Why is God doing that? Well, it says he's angry. God's angry with his people. Specifically, he's angry with what? It doesn't say that, God, how long will you be angry with the sins of your people? Obviously, that's implied. But that's not what it says. God, how long will you be angry at the rebellion of your people? That's not what it says. God, how long will you be angry with your people refusing to seek you in prayer? That's not, that's not what it says. God, how long will you be angry with the prayers of your people? And that's, that's an interesting thought, that God is angry with the prayers of his people. What would make God angry with the prayers of his people? If God can be angry with prayers, I want to know why. <laughs> if it's possible for me to be praying in a way that actually stirs up God's anger, I want to know what that is. And I hope you do too, because I don't want to anger my God. Well, looking at the nation of Israel at this point in its history, it's not hard to see why God is angry with their prayers. Think about it. Israel, if we read through the prophets at all, and we read through um, the books of Chronicles and Kings, we see that Israel was just a blatantly idolatrous nation for so much of, its later, so much of all of its history, but especially its later history. They may have been going to God and offering up these prayers on the Sabbath day. But then later that afternoon or the next day, they were going and offering prayers to the gods of the nations. 
And they may have been offering sacrifices to God in the morning, but then by the time the afternoon came, they were sacrificing offer, offerings to, to Baal. And so, yeah, the people were praying to God, but their praying was plagued by unrepentant hypocrisy. And unrepentant, hypocritical prayer cannot be pleasing to God. Even if we say with our mouth, in Jesus' name, if you're praying with an unrepentant, blatantly unrepentant and hypocritical heart, that, that prayer is not going to be pleasing to God. When they came to offer prayers to God, there's, there's no evidence here in this psalm that the people for whom Asaph is praying were repentant. And, and maybe you'll look at that. So look, look at verses 4 to 6. I mean, they're, they're, they're weeping. They're crying. You would think that, that maybe tears were evidence of some form of, of sorrow, of repentance. But it's not. Tears in themselves are never an evidence of genuine repentance. They're, they're sorrowful because of their circumstances. They're really sad because they're in a bad situation. They are not grieved because they've offended God. They're not, a, they're not, they're not grieved because of their, of their sin. So this is a warning to us. One of the commentators that I, I read, he said this, One of the great troubles of the Christian life is that we are naturally so much more affected and oppressed with natural than with moral evil, with our sufferings than with our sinfulness. I'll read that one more time. We are so much more affected and oppressed with natural or circumstantial rather than moral evil, with our sufferings rather than with our sin. That's a, that's a good warning for us. We're reminded of that in 2 Corinthians 7, and we should remember this morning that sorrow does not necessarily mean repentance. Repentance looks like abandoning sin, not just being sorrowful over its consequences. And so religious formality, even prayers, with our, without repentance, are worthless. God has no interest in in unrepentant prayers. And of course, there's not an exact parallel here between Psalm 80 and, and, and the new covenant believer. We know that back then there were a lot of people who were God's people, according to the nation of Israel, who didn't have regenerate, regenerate hearts. There was a remnant, but not all of Israel was converted. We know that in the new covenant, those who are part of the new covenant have been converted. They've been given new hearts. They love God. And so there's not an exact parallel, but the harm and the punishment, sorry, the, I shouldn't, I, I jumped ahead in my notes, not harm and punishment. Ignore those words because that's important. Don't ignore that. Not harm and punishment. But the discipline that results from unrepentance then still reflects God's attitude towards sin today. And so he has not changed. His, his appraisal of sin has not changed. He hates it. He despises it. But there's, here's where that harm and punishment comes in. There's an important distinction to make as well. When we think of God's anger toward us for our sin, we have to remember that his anger toward us as his children works for us and not against us. He's our father who loves us, and the anger that he has for, because of our sin never works toward our harm and punishment. It always works toward our good, namely holiness, namely refinement, purity, a greater joy in him, a greater hope in him, less hope in this world, less running to sin to satisfy, less being deceived by the cravings of our, of our sinful flesh. That's what God has in mind for you and in store for you. That's what he wants for you. If you belong to him, his greatest interest in your life is your holiness and your joy in him. And so his anger over your sin, it, it never produces your harm, ultimately. It might come through some painful processes of discipline, but it always works toward your holiness and your good. And I should also clarify that not every painful trial that we go through uh, should cause us to immediately think that we're in sin. Not, not every painful trial that we experience is the result of sin. God, in his love for us and in his perfect wisdom, he, he, wisdom, he causes us to go through all sorts of trials in this life 
that have nothing to do with any particular sin necessarily in our own hearts. He has all kinds of manifold, wise purposes for why he allows us to endure trials and sufferings in this life. So we shouldn't think immediately, I'm suffering, therefore there must be some blatant sin in my life that I'm not seeing. It should probably cause us to examine our hearts and make sure, but not immediately assume and get lost in some introspection thinking that I have to figure out what sin it is exactly that's causing God to do this to me. That would be a wrong process of thinking. But the warning remains. Don't pray unrepentant prayers. God has no interest in them. If you pray, Lord, restore me, and yet at the same time you know there's some secret sins in your heart and you know you're just unwilling to give them up, you're making a mockery of God, at least trying to. You're, you're thinking that you can hide some sin in your heart that God doesn't see. You, you can trick God. You can pray, God, all I want is you. All I want is your face. All I want is, is for you to shine your face upon me and restore me. But God sees your heart and he, he knows, no, that's not what you want. If you wanted nothing more than my face to shine upon you, then when you see blatant, ongoing, unrepentant sin in your life, you'd be grieved by it and you would turn from it. And so if you pray in the morning, Lord, cause your face to shine on me while secretly you know later that afternoon you're going to harbor some pet sin in your heart and you have no interest in repenting of it. God has no interest in that prayer. Don't pray unrepentant prayers. If you are God's child, if you are in Christ and you're hiding secret sins in your heart, refusing to repent of them, then, then you can pretty much be assured that because of God's love for you, he's going to drag you through a painful process of purification. So repent. That's, that's the solution. Repent. Desire him. Sin is, is deceit. Whatever you're believing about sin this morning that makes you desire it, it's a lie. It's false. And it will either lead you to hell if you refuse to repent, ultimately, or if you are in Christ, it will certainly lead you through a very painful process as a means of drawing that sin out of you. So don't pray unrepentant prayers. God has no interest in them. And then finally, the last stanza there, God's past kindness gives us hope for future mercy. Look at verses 8 to 11 before we look at the rest of the verses. He says, You removed the vine from Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared around the ground before it, and it took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shadow and the cedars of God with its boughs. It was, sent out, it, it was sending out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. And so obviously the psalmist Asaph, he now compares this uh, nation of Israel to a vine. God, like, a, like a vine, God uprooted them from Egypt and he planted them in, in the promised land. He, uh, he prepared the land. He removed the enemy so that there was fertile soil for the, this new vine to be planted. And once he had planted it, he caused it to grow and to flourish. And look at the language he uses. He says, to the mountains, all the way to, uh, let's see, mountains to the, to the south. So uh, I lost my place in the passage. The mountains were covered with its shadow and the cedars of God with its boughs. Okay, where are the mountains with regard to, to Israel's geography? To the south. And where are the cedars of Lebanon? To the north. And then it says, to the sea you extended its branches. But where's the sea? To the west. A and to the shoots of the river. I keep going backwards, but over here would be what? East. So from south to north, from west to east, God, you caused your people to be abundant, to multiply, to spread out and to prosper. And then now in verse 12 to 13, why have you broken down its hedges? So that all who pass that way pick its fruit. A boar from the forest eats it away, and whatever moves in the field feeds on it. And then verse 16, it's burned with fire. It's cut down. They perish at the rebuke of your countenance. So picture a hedge all around the nation of Israel, which is God himself. God himself is the hedge of Israel. He has protected this nation for years, despite their, their often rebellion against him. And yet there came a point where Asaph says, God, you, you removed the hedge altogether. You opened up the nation of Israel so much that whatever beast passed by, 
there was just utter vulnerability for it to come in and feast on your people. Assyria has come and just sacked your people like a wild animal coming to feed on a vine. And he says, why God? Why have you removed this hedge? So an an important reminder is, is found here. What was it all along, and we know this, let me pose you a rhetorical question. What was it all along that protected the nation of Israel from the surrounding nations? God. It was God. He had set up this hedge. You know, they, they, they often went to try to make alliances with the nations, and that did nothing for them. All along, it was God who was protecting them, who was hedging them in away from their enemies, away from the surrounding nations. But look how quickly things decline. The moment that God removes the hedge of protection, the nations come in and they feast on Israel. Just like that, it falls. It's scattered. It's gone. There's a, a tiny little remnant remaining. And that's, that's the same for you and me. Your only hope at all, at any point in time in your life, your only hope is the, is the hedging in of God's grace. His sustaining, preserving, protecting grace in your life. If God were to pull back that hedge of protection from you for a moment, you, not, not even for the blink of an eye would you be able to withstand your enemies, sin and temptation and that roaring lion who walks around, looking, prowls around looking for someone to devour. You'd be hopeless. And the the realization of that, it it ought to make us follow Asaph's pattern here and and pray, God, I I can do nothing. If you were to remove your hedge of protection, I I would be hopeless. And and so it ought to to drive us to prayer. And if you feel, so look back the last couple weeks of your life, the past couple months, maybe the past year. And if you feel like, man, I, I feel like I have experienced less victory over temptation in this past year than at any other point in my Christian life. What is going on? I feel like I have stumbled more in this past week than I ever thought I would as a Christian. Or maybe it's not that extreme. Maybe it's just I, I feel weaker than, than I normally do. I feel more vulnerable. I lose my temper more. I, I, things come out of my mouth that I never thought would. My eyes are looking at things that I never thought they would look at again. What, what is, what's happening? then consider whether God is very, very gently nudging you toward the remembrance that you can do nothing apart from his grace. And when you realize that, if it doesn't drive you to prayerfulness, nothing's going to change over here. If you do not take the, the recognition of your vulnerability to temptation apart from the grace of God, if you do not use that as an opportunity to seek God in prayer, and to fall upon him in reliance, things aren't going to get better for you spiritually. It is God in his grace who sustains you. That's a good thing, because he's a strong God, and his grace is sufficient, and he wants us to seek him for his grace. And so if you feel weak, good. Use it as an advantage or an opportunity to seek the sustaining grace of the God who hedges you in. And then finally, to finish, there's hope for future mercy, verses 14 to 18. So God's past mercy, as as the psalmist looks back on the past mercy of God toward Israel, it creates in him a greater hope for future mercy. God's past kindnesses lead to a hope of future mercy. Verses 14 to 18. O God of hosts, turn again now, we beseech you. Look down from heaven and see, and take care of this vine, even the shoot which your right hand has planted, and on the son whom you have strengthened for yourself. It's burned with fire. It's cut down. They perish at the rebuke of your countenance. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, upon the son of man whom you made strong for yourself. Then we shall not turn back from you. Revive us, and we will call upon your name. Look at that language. Verse 14. Turn again. Look down. See. Take care of this vine. One a uh, theologian that I read, he said, let thine eye affect thy heart. Let thine eye affect thy heart. That's our prayer. We're God's shoot. We're the people that God has redeemed. 
All who are of faith in Christ are God's people. And we as his people can say, God, let thine eye affect thy heart. You're not indifferent to our suffering. You're, you're not indifferent to our weakness, to our trials, to our pain, toward our doubts, toward the temptations that we face. You're not indifferent. God, let thine eye of our affliction affect thy heart. Give ear, hear us, look on us, and come and take care of this vine. And there's some amazing language in this psalm, and in its immediate context, we know that it's Israel that's in mind here, the son of man, the son whom you have strengthened for yourself. But we also know that as we come to the New Testament, there's a true son of man, and there's a true vine. And so the psalmist is pleading, Lord, look down on this vine. Take care of this vine. Strengthen the Son of Man, your people, Israel. Strengthen them. And as you strengthen them, they will not turn back from you. If you sustain them by your grace, they'll never call on another God again. Come, God, look down on this vine. Look down on the Son of Man, the Son, Israel, whom you have strengthened for yourself, for your own glory. Then we get to the New Testament and we read the Son of God come in flesh, the Son of Man who laid down his life, for the ransom of many. We read of John 15, the one who is the true vine. Jesus is the true vine. And so as we read this psalm, this hope that God will not abandon the, abandon the vine that he has planted, we're led forward several hundred years in history to see the true vine and the true son of man who was crushed for our iniquities who made our salvation secure so that it could be said of all who are redeemed by the blood of Jesus, they will never ultimately turn away. They'll never again fail to call upon the God of their salvation. Yes, there'll be times where we stumble and fall, but God in his grace, because we are joined to the vine who is Christ, he will always restore his people. He will perfect that work which he began in us. Not because of you, and something you can do. But it says here, for thyself. His love for you is an expression of his glory. And because of his own glory, and, and because how much his love is wrapped up in his own glory, he will not let you stumble. He will restore you. And he will bring you to completion. He'll do that as a process through this life. And then in the final day, he will do that at the return of Christ when you are made perfect forever together with Jesus. There's a, a true vine, a true shoot of Israel, and it's, it's Christ. He's the hope. And, and if you think about the way that John describes Jesus as the true vine, it's amazing, the parallel. And so we read in, in Psalm 80 about how the branches of this vine, they spread out and were fruitful. And then what does Jesus say about those who are joined to the vine in John chapter 15? They bear fruit. If you are joined to the vine, he will cause you to bear fruit. And just like Israel was to do, to spread across the nations and be fruitful, he will cause his people to multiply and to grow and to bear fruit for his sake. And so that's, that's good news for us who want something more solid to hope in than ourselves. We have the vine, the true vine, and all who abide in him will, will bear fruit for the glory of God. How, how closely, let me ask you, in the last two minutes, how closely does your hope for your own life and your hope for the church reflect this last stanza of the psalm? With regard to the church, do you look around now at, at not necessarily just our local church, but the church in our nation and the church around the world and see too much division and too much apathy and too much dullness? and a lack of love, and a, and a lack of radiance of holiness. And do you think, you know what, fatalistically, you just say, that's, that's the way it is. Or do you look at your own heart, your own life, and you see your own dullness, and your own coldness of heart, and your own perceived lack of growth and maturity, and the sin in your life, the lack of devotion when you bow before God in prayer, as you see those things in your heart, what's your, what's your response? Do you hope, like the psalmist, 
that God who has joined you tr- to the true vine will not forsake the vine that he's planted by his own hand. He's redeemed you by the blood of his son. You can hope for better days than the day that you're living in. You can hope for a greater reflection of Christ than the reflection of Christ that you now possess and display. There is no such thing as a Christian of hopelessness. Do you feel hopeless? Do you feel like you're in despair? There's no such thing as hopeless Christianity. If you believe that your Christianity is hopeless, that your sanctification process is hopeless, and that your fight against temptation is hopeless, you're deceived, you need to come back to God's word and be reminded there is no such thing as a hopeless Christian. He will continue his grace in you. And yet, on the other hand, there's no such thing as a hopeful non-Christian. There's no such thing as hope outside of Christ. He's the vine in whom there's security from God's wrath. Unless you are joined to the true vine, like the nation of Israel, the hedges of protection against the wrath of God, they're gone. You have no protection against the punishment that your sin deserves. There is hope in Christ. There is no hope outside of Christ. And so the exhortation at its very foundational level this morning is for you to ask yourself, are you in this vine? Are you connected to the true vine? Is there repentance in your life that reflects someone who legitimately knows God as their king and as their shepherd, as the one who cultivates the garden of the hearts of his people. If you're outside of Christ this morning, no matter what those in our society might tell you and no matter what your own deceitful heart tells you, God has made very clear that you are without hope and without God and that there is only the anticipation of judgment for you. And yet this vine is extended to you. He, he reaches even you and your sin. And if you turn to him, if you trust in Jesus, there's freedom and security and the assurance of everlasting hope. So this morning, don't stay away from him. Don't continue to be hopeless, whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian. Come to Jesus. And he is our hope. He's the hope of Israel, the Israel of God. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the way that your word corrects us. We thank you that you love us enough, even at times, to discipline us. Father, we thank you that though our hearts are prone to wander, you preserve us. We thank you that you're our shepherd who cares for us. We thank you that you're the king who's enthroned above the cherubim who meets with us. We pray, Father, that you would work in our hearts a deep repentance as we long for restoration as your people as we long to be made whole, to be made complete. We pray that you would work in us, God, a genuine love for you and a hatred of all that displeases you. And God, we pray that you would create in us a deep rest in the hope that we have because we're joined to the true vine. God, help us to believe that of all who are joined to Christ, you will lose not one of them. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.